All right, we're going. So, everybody, welcome to Classics 160D2, a classical mythology, and today's lecture on Hestia, the goddess of the hearth, and Dionysus, the god of wine, one of my personal favorite gods from the ancient Greek world, both because of his love of wine and his general love of just having a good old crazy time. So here's what we got on the docket. We'll start with a few announcements. I will talk more uh, about the exam next Friday and what I will have for you in preparation for that uh, this Friday. We're going to finish off uh, with Hermes and the story of Pan and Syrinx. Then we'll talk very, very briefly about Hestia, the goddess of the hearth, uh, in large part because there's just not that much to talk about. She doesn't like show up in that many myths. She doesn't have a lot of temples, that sort of thing. Uh, but you know who there is a lot to talk about? Our main man, Dionysus, the god of wine and good times, and also sometimes just dismembering people and ripping them apart. Or at least his followers kind of do that. So, announcements and recap. You guys know the deal now, right? Put this thing in speaker mode up in the corner up there. Then uh, go ahead. You can see the notes here. You can see me. I've tried to make myself kind of smaller so my head doesn't block out all the text above me here. Um... We are going to try to have those research proposals back to you on Friday, all right? Uh, if that's possible, great. If not, TAs, if you guys can get those done by Monday, you're doing a bang-up job on those. Keep up the, the good work. And then this Friday, I am going to have uh, some more information on the midterm, all right? So here is what it looks like. There are going to be 25 multiple-choice questions, all right? And that's going to make up half the value of the test. So two points each. 50 points total. Then there will be one essay question, all right? That's gonna be worth 50 points. And so you can see based on the weighting that you're probably gonna to wanna to spend a half the time, maybe a little bit less doing the multiple choice and half the time doing the essay question, right? If you're only getting you know, the last 10 minutes to write the essay, it's probably gonna be a little bit shorter than we want for these. Now there's no like specific, um, there's no specific amount of time or amount of words that I'm looking for, but it will be graded on the, the quality of your response and the quantity of your response. Uh, so if you've got like three sentences, that's probably a little bit short. Uh, if you've written a short novel, that's probably a little bit long. If you're somewhere in the middle, uh, that's good. Um, okay, now what I'm gonna do for you guys on Friday is I'm going to, uh, to give you a list of 10 to 12 essay questions. Okay, and one of those essay questions is going to be the question that you guys actually get on the test. So if you guys want to spend the next week like outlining each of the 12 essay topics and knowing what you're going to write for each one, beautiful, right? If you want to guess which one it's going to be and do a thorough writing of one of the essays and just hope for that. Awesome, good luck. <laughs> you have about like a, you know, eight to 10% chance of getting it right. Um, if you want to uh, do nothing and not study for those, not that awesome. You probably should study for those. Uh, but they will be there on Friday for your, um, uh, yeah, for, for your use over the course of the next week getting ready for Friday's exam. All right, uh, TAs, go ahead and uh, pay attention for a second, uh, TAs. I need your help on the essay question portion here, right? I want each of us to develop two questions, okay? So I'm gonna develop two, each of you uh, GATs develop two questions. Um, can you email them to me like Friday morning or something like that? Uh, and then I will organize those um, and we'll put those out for the students Friday during class or right after class or something along those lines. Uh, and then I will choose the one that we're actually gonna use early to middle of next week. For the exam itself, this thing's on D2L, okay? Um, it's gonna be open at 11 a.m. next Friday. It's gonna close like at noon next Friday. So you wanna start that thing right at 11 a.m. If you have accommodations, right? If there's any like kind of um, accommodations that you have for extra time or anything like that, go to the DRC and submit your request through them the DRC emails me and I will put it in there, right? And so um, what will end up happening is I will like extend the time if you get time and a half from 50 minutes to 75 minutes, right? A uh, couple questions um, 
a uh, couple questions in the chat regarding the test. Um, Matt, can I make you a co-host? I think I can make you a co-host. Let me see here. Uh, you should automatically be a co-host. Boom, all right. That, done. How long is the essay? Uh, again, something more than three sentences, something longer than a short novel. Other than that, it's up to you, right? Like, it tends to be that, like, if you have more things to say, that's probably good. You're supporting your ideas with more uh, evidence. Um, but if it's just fluff and you're just, like, writing just kind of nonsense, that doesn't really help you. So... Yeah, that's what that is. Uh, it is open note, that's correct. The great and beneficent Dr. Rob has made this an open note exam. Uh, it will be um, from 11 to 11.50. Uh, and so yeah, you wanna start this thing right at 11. Um, it is not proctored, so we're not um, we're not doing like examity or one of those things where like, like, I don't know, it's kind of, those things are kind of creepy. If you've ever used them, it's like somebody like comes through your webcam and like watches you as you take the test. And if you like go like over here to have like a, a sip of coffee or something, they're like, cheater, cheater. And uh, I don't we're not we're not messing with that. So open note, no proctoring. Um, and uh, yeah, that's going to be the way the test works. Um, if you have any questions, go ahead and get in touch with your TAs. They will collate some of the questions. Yeah, TAs, if you can kind of like keep track of some of the ones that are coming in that haven't been answered, get those to me. And um, and then Friday morning, we can tackle some more of these. All righty. So Hermes, the messenger god. Uh, remember, we talked about last time uh, how Hermes was the messenger um, for the gods, right? Between kind of uh, the gods themselves also between gods and people, right? And so an example, him going down to deliver Zeus's message to Calypso that she's got to let Odysseus go on his way so he can get back to good old Penelope on the island of Ithaca. We have also seen how to identify Hermes, right? His sweet traveler's cap, his winged Nike sandals, and the caduceus, right? Uh, the staff with the wings on it, the two snakes intertwined. We heard about the story of Tiresias, how he was like bopping snakes over the head and killing them, and then he turned into a woman, and then he bopped the other one on the head, and then he turned back into a dude, and then the snakes wrapped around the, the, the staff that he had, and it became magical and transformative. Now, we also saw that Hermes is the god of the roads, right? Uh, in, addition, in addition to being a messenger, right? He's also one of the gods of people traveling along those roads. And we can see that in the story of Priam going to the Greeks, begging for the body of his son. And it's kind of Hermes allowing him to get through the Greek camp unnoticed. And we also saw, right, uh, the idea that Hermes is represented in a couple different ways, right? So we've got like actual like human Hermes, uh, either a youth with the clean shaven face or with the beard representing an adult. Um, with the cap and the sandals and the wand, right? That sort of thing. And we also get Hermes represented as a creatively called Herm, right? And these are these stone pillars that feature uh, not one, but two different heads, right? A head and a phallus. And the idea is that these grew out of these kind of Hermes hills, right? These little piles of stones that would have marked the way along trails and that they are a symbol both of protection and of fertility. And we saw that protection and fertility, right, were a very, a very big deal, if you will, uh, in the ancient Greek world. And we can see that uh, with the phallus as this symbol, uh, this kind of apotropaic symbol, right? So apotropaism or apotropaic is basically a way to ward off evil. So if you think of something like the evil eye today, right, it's something that, uh, similar to that. And they would have these different statues or frescoes or vase paintings um, where the, uh, the phallus kind of represents this ability both to ward off evil as well as uh, kind of serve as a symbol of fertility, both kind of physically in the terms of, you know, human reproduction, as well as um, kind of commercially, right, bringing good fortune to the, uh, the people in the home. This is one of the all-time great frescoes throughout the ancient Roman world. It's at the entrance to a house in Pompeii, and you can see uh, Priapus here um, with his enlarged 
engorged member um, and uh, weighing this against a, a sack of gold here. So there you go, bringing wealth and protection to the people of the household. So when we get to it, I actually cut off a couple of these at the end here, but when you get to it, Hermes is the god of a lot, right? You don't have to remember all of these. Remember the things like, you know, the god of people on the roads, um, a god, the, the messenger god, the ones that we've talked a lot about, um, but also take into account just that he's the god of many, many things, right? Uh, messengers and trade and boundaries and travelers, herdsmen, um, public speakers, tricksters, uh, contests. He's the ram bearer. We, we didn't see that, but uh, he's often seen carrying a ram as part of one of the rituals of a, a particular city state. Um, a luck bringer, the golden tongued. Hermes is the god of many, many things. Okay, so he also has many offspring. One of the most famous, of course, is Pan, right? And you're looking at a, a depiction of Pan here, and he, as you can see, is half man, right? Upper half, pretty much man. He's got a couple horns on top of his head, and then half goat. He's very frequently represented as, as iffy phallic, right? Remember, that was the adjective we used for uh, having uh, an erect phallus. Um, and uh, that is because he's always going around chasing nymphs, uh, basically ready to have a very good time. Um, so Pan, in addition uh, to um, kind of being one of the creatures of the forest, he's also somebody who frequently incites panic, right? That's where we get the word. Um, and so an example of this, sometimes the, uh, the Persian troops uh, at the Battle of Marathon were said to be sent into a panic by Pan, uh, and it's that disorder that allowed the Athenians to defeat them. All right, so Pan is kind of like this, like, you can kind of think of him as this kind of like hippie god. Uh, so he just kind of hangs out in the forest. He loves nature. He loves wine. He likes parties. Uh, he loves the ladies, the nymphs. Um, he's always chasing them around. His sons, between like himself and all these like nymphs, they end up being satyrs, um, who also are half man and half goat, also really, really like their wine, also are known for chasing ladies around uh, in a rather unscrupulous manner. Uh, so Pan himself, he's not like a, um, he's not like a particularly like good looking dude. So this is one of the all time great statues from the, uh, the ancient Greek world. Um, so this is what if and when uh, you go to Athens, you have to go to the National Archaeological Museum. And when you go there, you're going to see this great statue uh, of Pan over here, right? With his like uh, with his like horn sticking out of his head, little tiny baby Cupid, little Eros up here, and uh, then Aphrodite over here. Um, and as you can see, Aphrodite is about to smack Pan with a shoe, with her sandal. <laughs> like, get off of me, you horny little goat man. Um, and yeah, that's exactly what's happening. But he likes to have a good time um, and uh, extremely like kind of happy-go-lucky dude. Now, he's also known for creating the pan pipes, uh, you know, these kind of reeds that are bound together. Uh, they make music that emanate from the woods at night, right, as the winds blow, that sort of thing. And you might be asking, well, how did those pan pipes arise? Well, I'm going to tell you. So it all begins in Arcadia, right? And if you remember, Arcadia is in the middle of the Peloponnese, kind of think far away from Athens, far away from Delphi, in the middle of nowhere, basically, right, out in nature. And there, there are dryads, right? These wood nymphs. And uh, in particular, there's one known as Syrinx. And Syrinx, very good looking dryad. She's a great hunter, she's passionate. And Pan sees her and he's, well, excited to say the least. And so Pan asks Syrinx out, right? He's like, hey, pretty lady, you wanna go out on a date with me? I'm half man, half goat, it's pretty fun. Uh, and she's like, absolutely not. I would not like that. Uh, and then does that stop him? Of course not. If you've even been to one of these classes so far, you know, that doesn't stop him at all. And so he starts chasing her with his little like goat legs, right? And he's running around chasing her and she's running around trying to get away from him. And eventually she comes to a river, the river laid on and she has nowhere else to go. And sh so she like, cries out to her river nymph friends for help. 
And I don't know if this actually is help, but they turn her into like, like a series of reeds, right? So like what you're looking at over here, I, <laughs> you'd think they maybe would be a little bit more helpful, but that's what they do. Um, and Pan, by the time he gets there, right, he gets to the river and she's gone. She's nowhere to be found. And he's so sad and he has a frowny face. And he lets out one last sigh, like, oh. And it's such a powerful sigh that the sigh blows across the reeds, right? And as it goes over the reeds, it creates this nice, beautiful sound. Um, and it's such a nice sound that he's like, oh, I should, I, I should turn that into an instrument. So he chops out some of the reeds. And this is where, I don't know if that's actually chopping part of Syrinx or whatever it is, but he takes them and he, he ropes them together and he creates the pan pipe, also known as the Syrinx, so that he can always be with her. And so that's the end of another very disturbing love story from ancient Greece. It kind of sounds romantic. And then you actually think about like the whole story and you're like, that's not romantic at all. That's just him being a terrible person and uh, trying to have whatever he wants, no matter what anybody else thinks about it. But anyway, that's how you get the pan pipes. Let's move on. Uh, that doesn't like stop him there. It doesn't like walk away with his pan pipes and be like, okay, well now I have my syrinx forever. I need no other ladies. No, he needs all the other ladies. Um, and uh, so we get the forest nymph Pittus. Uh, she runs away and transforms herself into a pine tree over here to get away from him. You can see in this Roman mosaic pan here, represented as Iphiphallic there. Uh, he eventually wins over Selena, the moon, um, but only because he's like dressing up as a sheep. I'm not really sure how that's supposed to help, but it does. And then she likes him because she thinks she's a, he's a sheep instead of a goat, I guess. Um, and, uh, oh, good question in the chat here. What are the nymphs? The nymphs are these kind of like um, minor uh, divinities, right? They're not at the same level of the Olympian gods. Uh, frequently, they're produced between gods and mortals, something like that. And they're very frequently associated with different aspects of nature. So you get wood nymphs, you get uh, river nymphs, sea nymphs, that sort of thing. All right, so we are done with Hermes. We are done with Pan. Let us move on to Hestia, the goddess of the hearth. And this is going to be very, very short here, all right? So Hestia is sisters uh, of that kind of generation of... Um, Zeus and Hera and Poseidon and Hades and Demeter, uh, the daughter of Cronus and Rhea. And you can frequently uh, identify her because of the veil, kind of like you see here, um, frequently holding a branch, that sort of thing. And if there's one thing that you want to kind of remember about Hestia, right? She's the goddess of the hearth to the point where her name literally means the hearth. Okay, so the Hestia is the word for hearth in ancient Greek. Um, Hestia is the hearth, all right? So one of the reasons this section is going to be so short is because there are basically no temples or rituals or cult shrines to Hestia uh, in the ancient Greek world. Um, you actually do get it in the Roman world to, uh, to Vesta. Um, and, uh, you can see that actually in the Roman forum, there's, there's partial remains of this round temple. And that's where the kind of everlasting flame of Rome, uh, would have been kind of burning perpetually. Oh, good question here. What is a hearth? Uh, so what you're looking at here is kind of a hearth, right? The hearth would be, um, essentially the fireplace in every ancient Greek home. And it's particularly important, right? Uh, because it's not like a house today where you have like a fireplace and then like three days in winter you like have a fire and it's like nice and you like sip hot cocoa and you're like this is so nice we should we should live somewhere cold it's so pleasant here um no a hearth in ancient greece is the centerpiece of the home right you need this to cook all your food on they don't have fancy like stoves and stuff like that you need the hearth to cook on you need the hearth for warmth right they don't have like central heating uh like we do today it's just a fire in the middle of the home. So the hearth is the centerpiece of each home. Um, and you can kind of think of it as a ultra important fireplace. Okay. Um, now, one of the things that we get with Hestia is even though she doesn't have her own temple and, and, and shrines and things like that, she frequently does get little parts of each sacrifice. And she's especially worshipped 
within each family's home, right? So think about that. Instead of going out to the main temple or something, uh, Hestia is worshipped within the home. And that's where we get the kind of main ritual associated with Hestia. And that's the Amphidromia, right? Or Amphidromia ritual. And this is a ritual that revolves around childbirth. And so two weeks after the child is born, there's a festival, right, the Amphidromia, inside the home, kind of a private festival, that makes the child officially part of the family. And you can think about, like, oh, well, why don't you do this on, like, the day it's born or something? Just put it down next to the, the hearth. And, well, you know, infant mortality was pretty bad in antiquity, right? Like, there was a not insignificant chance that your baby was just not going to make it, especially in those first few days. And so part of the reasoning behind waiting two weeks is just, like, you almost don't want to invest too much uh, emotional energy in the baby if it's going to die. And that sounds really, really harsh, uh, but you see this in different places in the ancient world where frequently they won't like, um, you know, get names or something until after a period of time. And frequently that's to deal with the issue of, of infant mortality. So in the Amphidromia, uh, what we end up with um, is, uh, okay, two weeks after the child's born, the father uh, or the, the child is placed next to the hearth and then the father runs around the hearth in the, the, the room three times. And the idea here is that this binds everybody together, right? It binds the child to the family and it binds the family and the child to the hearth. And it kind of also shows how the hearth is very literally at the center kind of of the family there. So if you remember uh, kind of a couple things about Hestia, right? She is the goddess of the hearth. Her name means the hearth. The one ritual associated with her has to deal with the hearth and with uh, kind of the bringing of a child into the family, that sort of thing. So let's move on and talk about Dionysus, the god of wine. It really fe it feels like I should be like, I should have like a nice glass of wine here while I talk about Dionysus. I, I don't know what the rules are. I don't think I can do that. I'll, I'll inquire maybe for the next class. Um, we'll see. Co coffee instead. He's not the god of coffee, but coffee's pretty good too. Uh, so again, here is the kind of overview of Dionysus. Uh, just for your use, you can go back and check some of it out. Um, he is the, uh, the child of Zeus and Semele, um, and uh, he has several different sons. You can identify uh, Dionysus usually by kind of a wreath around his head, right, symbolizing fertility. Usually he's got a nice old cup of wine going on. He's got the Thyrsus, all right? So like how Hermes had the Caduceus, uh, Dionysus has the Thyrsus. And that's this kind of like plant stalk, again, kind of symbolizing vines and fertility. Uh, and it's topped with ivy or grape leaves or both, something along those lines. And we'll talk about these rituals that we get over here, especially the anthesteria, anth anthesteria a little bit later today. Um, and then on Friday, uh, TAs, if you guys are out there, one of the things I'd like you guys to talk about on Friday uh, is the connection between Dionysus and the theater. Um, so both like kind of how Dionysus is linked to the theater and how like the plays that we're reading, like the Bacchae for this week, actually fit into kind of like what theater is in ancient Greece. Uh, and then along with that, both the, uh, the city and the country Dionysia festivals. So if you guys can like have one or two parts to Friday's deal on that, that would be super sweet. But we will talk about the Anthesteria today, and if we have time at the end, we'll also talk about the, the mystery cult of Dionysus, uh, which we know in large part because of uh, the archaeological remains at the site of Pompeii. Okay, so let's talk, let's talk about the birth of the god of wine. Um, okay. So Dionysus is the son of Zeus and Semele. We're going to get actually two stories here. This is kind of the normal one. And then we'll talk about the Orphic uh, tradition of the birth of Dionysus. And we'll talk a little bit about who Orpheus is. Uh, he was so sad. We'll, we'll talk about him in a second. Anyway, back to starting the stories the way all Greek myths start, right? Uh, with the beautiful mortal woman. Um, and uh, she's, she's doing great. She's sacrificing to Zeus in this river. And you think Zeus would be happy. And he is happy, and, but then he gets a little bit too happy and too excited. 
And so uh, Mortal Semele is like, it must have been a very bloody sacrifice. She's like washing the blood off of herself in this river. Um, and uh, Zeus sees her. And so, of course, in Zeus form, he like swoops down. But actually, he doesn't swoop down, right? So this is not like slight twist on the classic like Zeus just turning into an eagle and snatching whatever or whoever he wants and flying off. Um, instead, uh, Zeus doesn't snatch her, but instead he comes to her in the middle of the night and he's made himself this time. He's not bothering with any cow disguise or transforming himself into a different looking dude. He's just completely invisible. He makes himself invisible. Uh, and when Semele wakes up the next day, she knows she's pregnant, right? And she can feel that it's not a normal pregnancy. This is the child of a god. But being invisible, Zeus uh, has not revealed himself, and she doesn't know which god. Now, normally that would be fine if it weren't for Hera, right? So good old jealous Hera. Um, well, she's not too happy about this, uh, which is kind of like understandably so. And like usual, it's not Zeus who has to pay the price. Instead, uh, she comes to Semele and she's gonna kind of take it out on her. So she comes to Semele, right? She transforms herself into this old lady, right? Think like Athena when she goes to see Arachne. Uh, and she transforms herself into this old lady here. And she kind of gets Semele to just start wondering like, like, oh, oh, don't you? Oh, you look pretty pregnant. I wonder who the dad is. I bet it's a god. I bet you don't know which one. I bet you wish you knew which one. And Semele just like can't stop thinking about this, right? So Zeus comes back a couple nights later and, you know, he's trying to be like, hey, what's going on? You know, like, um, how about I grant you a wish? And Semele says her one wish out of everything. I don't know why you don't just wish for a million other wishes, but she wishes that she knew or that the God who, uh, who impregnated her would reveal himself to her. And Zeus says, oh, oh, that's, that's a bad idea. That's a terrible idea. Um, you know, don't that just don't do that. And he gives her like a little bit of a lightning show, just a small little one. He's like, don't just it would be too bad for one of the gods to reveal themselves in all of the godly, godly glory. But Simile's like, nope, I'm sticking to it. I want the god to reveal himself. And so she wants to see this god in all of his gloriousness. And so Zeus starts growing, right? And he starts stretching out his arms. And his arms are like burning like fire and like lightning, right? And all of a sudden, the whole sky's bursting into like flames from lightning. And uh, basically, Semele is just engulfed in all of this. And so she's on fire and she's probably like, that was a terrible idea. Why did I do that? Uh, and so bad things are happen happening and poor Semele is burnt to a crisp like a slice of bacon. Now, Zeus here is, uh, well, now, now he decides he's going to be a good dude. And so he goes into the fire, right? And he, he finds the unborn baby boy, like tiny unborn baby boy. And, uh, but tiny unborn baby boy is like not ready to be born because he's unborn, okay? And so good old Zeus uh, gets out his sewing kit, right? And he cuts like a little thing in his leg and he stuffs little baby Dionysus into his leg and then sews his leg back up. And he's just like, just as good as a womb, you know? You don't even need a womb. You just put, put baby Dionysus into the leg, good to go. Very great dad, even if he's not very good to the ladies. Anyway, when he finally emerges from Zeus's thigh, uh, Dionysus, right, that tiny unborn baby boy, like Zeus is like, you look awesome. You can be a full immortal, right? Normally it'd be like a half and half situation. No way, you're too cool for that, you're immortal. And so that is the story um, of the birth of Dionysus. But he's not out of the woods yet, okay? And so Hera is still coming after him. She does not let these grudges just go by the wayside. And so Zeus has to put him off on a little island uh, to protect him. 
And he puts them off with uh, some of these these river nymphs, these Hyades, uh, who also become known as the Bacantes, or the followers of Bacchus, the kind of Roman name for Dionysus. And so we can see here, like, Dionysus just chilling there, just having a great time. Like, what a way to grow up, right? You're with, like, some river nymph babes. You, like, uh, are just chilling out, and you got nice views of the Mediterranean. Life is good. And so he's growing up happy and healthy. He starts wandering around. Uh, he's, like, tinkering with the grapes that are growing wildly there. And after a little bit of tinkering, he invents wine, right? Everybody loves it. Now, he's... So, Hera still isn't done, right? So he's having a great time. She eventually... Um, finds out where he is and uh, she makes him a little bit crazy, right? So she can't like kill him, but she can make him crazy. And in this kind of like drunken craziness, right? Bought on by Hera and perhaps a little too much wine, he starts roaming the world. I mean, he's going all over to like the very, very edges of like the, the kind of known Greek world at the time. And that's why one of the reasons uh, you'll very frequently see Dionysus with like the pelt of like a jaguar or a leopard or something like that, right? So you can see him in an ancient mosaic here on this kind of kind of leopard type thing. Uh, it's kind of like a leopard, right? And so he's riding around on that because he's found these wild animals on the very outskirts of his journey when he was all crazy. So he starts wandering some more. He eventually runs in uh, to his grandma. Uh, Rhea, right? Um, and so the Titanus Rhea, right, his grandmother on the his dad's side, uh, sees him, cures him of the curse. He just decides wandering around more. He's like showing people how to make wine. He makes it all the way to India on his like magical jaguar. And eventually he comes back to Greece, right? So after he's kind of gone on this journey, he comes back to Greece. He's hanging out with his son Pan and these nymphs and satyrs. Uh, and he's like, Greeks, you guys should try this wine. It is awesome. But the story for how like wine is actually introduced is pretty dark. Okay, so the first dude he runs into is this guy, Icarus, right? Different than Icarus, right? Icarus is like the guy with the wax wings flying around and burns in the sun. Uh-uh. This is Icarus. And he's like, Icarus, try some of this awesome wine. In fact, share it with your neighbors. And so Icarus, uh, you can see over here, right, takes that wine. He's like, neighbors, I have wine. Let us party. And so they drink a lot of the wine and they pass out. And this is bad because, like, the rest of the, the Greek world has never seen people pass out from wine drinking before. And they think Icarus has killed their, like, their families, right? Like, their, their dads from, like, this party, they think they're, the families and the dads are dead. No, they're not. They're just passed out and probably going to be very hungover. Uh, and then they kill Icarus, like, as revenge, because they don't know that, like, these dudes are just passed out. So then Icarus actually gets killed for real. And then his daughter, poor Erigone, ends up finding him. And she's like, why is my dad dead? And she's very distraught. And in a kind of like sort of like, um, I don't know, there's like aspects of kind of Romeo and Juliet kind of stuff. She finds her dad's body. She kills herself. She hangs herself uh, because she is so distraught. And thus is the story of like wine entering the ancient Greek world. It both leads to a great party, but also sometimes to some very, very bad things. And we'll see later today how Erigone... Um, actually comes up in this Anthesteria festival. Now, in the second version, um, oh, how did he die if he was immortal? Oh, so it's not Dionysus dying. It's uh, Icarus. It's just like regular dude, right? So he's just a regular dude. Dionysus sees him. He's like, here, have the wine. Take it to your buddies to party. Um, so that's, that's how he ends up dying. He's just a regular guy. Now, there's a whole other tradition with Dionysus' birth, and that's from something known as the Orphic tradition, from the, the Thracian legendary poet and musician Orpheus, right? So you might have even heard the term Orpheus or the word Orpheus before. And he's this kind of legendary poet in ancient Greece, and he starts writing his own version of a lot of different myths. And in this version, 
Um, uh, Dionysus, the son of Zeus, uh, but not Semele, but, but Persephone. Now, Orpheus himself um, is kind of best known for this myth of him and his wife, Eurydice. And uh, Eurydice um, ends up uh, dying. And Orpheus is so sad that he starts like constructing these songs that are like so like mournful and beautiful, but also sad that the gods are eventually are like, can you please just go get your wife out of Hades and like get with her again so that we don't have to listen to this anymore? Because it's so, so sad, even though it is beautiful. Uh, and then he goes down there and he gets her and he's talking to like Persephone and Hades and they're like, yes, you can have her. Just don't look back. Right. And I mean, you guys know where the story goes from there. They like get all the way out to the mouth of the cave, like um, uh, like the entrance way to Hades. Right. And Orpheus crosses the threshold. And once he's free, he looks back. But Eurydice has not crossed the threshold. And so then she is down in Hades forever. And Orpheus just has to go on singing his sad, sad songs. But in this tradition, um, for some reason or another, Orphe uh, uh, Dionysus is basically, um, yeah, Dionysus is torn apart. He's like shredded as a person, right? Limb from limb, he's torn apart. Uh, and the Olympian gods have to save him, right? So Zeus saves, saves his heart and limbs. Um, the heart is given to Athena, used to construct like a new Dionysus. The limbs are buried in your Delphi. And nobody really knows kind of what's going on with this dismemberment, but it becomes a thing associated with Dionysus. And it's actually going to be like a whole thing in your reading for Friday where the king um, in the, the story ends up getting ripped apart like this poor guy here, right? Great abs, like looks like he works out, ripped in two. Sad story, sad story. Anyway, that is our second story of the birth of Dionysus. Okay, so Dionysus' realm, right? Uh, a couple different things. So he's involved with wine and viticulture and fertility. Um, he's also involved uh, with the theater. We'll hear about that on Friday. We might not get to the, uh, the mystery cults today, so we might have to do that Friday as well. Um, but those three main things. Now, one of the things uh, that is kind of associated th with this is when we think about wine, um, and grapes and vines, like many of these kind of gods, right? He's the god of wine, but in conjunction with that, it's also the kind of wine representing fertility, right? So it's, it's wine and all that, but in some ways it's also uh, fertility, both kind of in agriculture again, as in actual human reproduction, that sort of thing. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the anthesteria. Uh, before we do that, let's go ahead and uh, we'll do the, we'll close with this today. Let's do the uh, the attendance right now. Uh, today, Heracles is white. Heracles is white. All right, go ahead and put that in. I will give you two minutes at 11.44. We will start back up.
All right, let's keep this going. Uh, also, to the story about the, uh, the the story of wine being given to the Greeks in Icarus, that's also the kind of explanatory story for why the ancient Greeks end up mixing their wine, right? So uh, normally in ancient Greece, um, instead of just drinking the wine itself, you end up mixing it with water uh, in order to make sure that you don't get too drunk, even though they very frequently got way too drunk. Let's close today by talking about the Anthesteria, um, or the, uh, the, the flower festival. Um, and this celebrates the, the gift of Dionysus, right? It celebrates the gift of wine uh, to humankind, while also being kind of intimately tied uh, to the idea of the souls of the deceased. And remember, we talked about a little bit on Monday with Hermes, his kind of uh, small role in this festival. So, wine and fertility. Now, the Anthesteria is a three-day festival. And what's kind of cool is each of these days is named after a ceramic vessel in ancient Greece, right? So each day has its name, and each name is based on some sort of ceramic vessel, like something that's actually used during that day. Uh, so the Pythogia, the, the first day of the festival, is based on the pithos, okay? And what you're looking at right here, these are pithoi, that's the plural of pithos, and you can think of these as large storage jars, Okay, so the, the main event of day one of this festival are these jars being brought out, they're filled with wine, and it's this kind of ritual opening of this year's like stock of wine, right? And they're like, hmm, that's great for a, you know, whatever it is, for 367 BC, hmm, good year for wine. Uh, so the idea is that they open the wine and in the opening of wine, they also kind of release the souls of the dead out into the actual world. So that's day one of the Anthesteria. Now, day two of the Anthesteria is based on this thing over here. And this is known as an oinakoi, right? So it's kind of a weird way to pronounce this. But the way you pronounce this is oinakoi. Uh, and the, the day itself is called the koes. Um, based on this, this type of jug. Now, what you end up doing uh, during day two is basically drinking a lot of wine out of the oinakui. And this is kind of weird, right? It turns into this kind of drinking contest, but it's very different than the way you would normally drink wine in ancient Greece. So normally when you're drinking, right, uh, what you do is you have the wine in, a, in something that looks like this. This is known as a crater, okay? And the crater sits in the middle of the room, and it's got the wine in it. You put some water in, you mix it up, and then people go get their cup, fill it with wine, and go back to their seat. Or they would fill up the oinakui right here, right, from the crater, and they would go pour it into their actual drinking vessels. But the idea is this is like, this is for pouring wine. But on day two of the Anthesteria, it's for drinking wine. And basically it's like a silent drinking contest to see who can finish their like jug of wine the first. No speaking is allowed, um, which is also very strange. Usually when you're drinking wine in ancient Greece, you're having a symposium, something like that, where there's a lot of conversation built into it. So the other thing that's going on during day two, right? Those souls that were left out or let out during day one are now wandering all around kind of the world. And it's actually thought that some people wore kind of masks, that sort of thing to represent the deceased souls. So day one, right? It's the opening of the wine, the letting out of the souls. Day two, it's this drinking contest as well as the kind of wandering of the souls. And on day three, uh, basically it's the culmination of all of this. So day three is known as the Kitroi, and it's based on these little like cooking pots here, right? So not quite as nice looking as the, uh, the Oinakui we just looked at, but the idea here is that you boil like kind of grain and honey inside of these things, and it serves as a sacrifice to the kind of souls that had been let out to let them go back down into the underworld. So that's one of the main events for day three. There's also this kind of symbolic marriage, and it's actually debated who's that, who that's representing. It could be Dionysus and Ariadne. Might talk a little bit about that. Um, or, uh, or kind of this symbolic queen, that sort of thing. It's, it's still debated there. And then the final thing that happens goes back to that story of the introduction of wine. And we get girls like swinging, right? Like on a, like on a swing, right? Uh, and they swing from ropes tied to trees, 
And this is to uh, recall uh, Erigone and the introduction of wine to Greece. Um, and it's kind of in a dark way, right? Like remembering her swinging from a tree in a very different kind of more permanent setting. Um, but the idea is that during this third day, the, the souls of the deceased then are, are through this sacrifice kind of being put back to rest. So let's go ahead and why don't we uh, wrap it up here for today um, and uh, we will pick back up uh, with Dionysus's relationship to the theater uh, on Friday, as well as a little bit about Euripides' Bacchae. So look, guys, have a wonderful couple of days. Um, I will also have those essay topics for you on Friday. Start studying, start organizing those notes, getting those in good order. And uh, I look forward to seeing everyone on Friday. Have a great couple of days.